I think this is one of um, the most um, fun lectures to give, actually. Um, because in, for this lecture, I'm going to let you guys do most of the talking. Um, probably the first five or ten minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about ethics. And then after that, I'm actually going to give you the opportunity to kind of um, argue a point about like whether you think something's ethical or what an ethical action would be in certain scenarios. Um, so we'll, we'll try and keep it civil though. So I want you guys to be, uh, you know, have a heated debate, but we'll just have like one person talking at a time, okay? So try and refrain till you see an opportunity to, to interject rather than um, all speaking at once, because otherwise we, just, we won't be able to manage it. So, um, so yeah, so what do you guys think of when you hear the word ethics, what do you think it means? Greek, yeah. But what do you think the what do you think the meaning of it is? Yeah. What's right and wrong? Right and wrong, yeah. Yes. Not necessarily bound by law. Not bound by law. Okay. Yep. Right and wrong defined by the mass populace. Defined by the mass populace. So like popular opinion or belief about morality. Civil opinion. Civil opinion. Civil law. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So that that's actually that's that's quite quite a good uh, approach to it. So so it's, is it about your feelings? What you feel to be right and wrong? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit more than that. Is it? I mean, some people will like mention things like religion, um, and then you could say, so, well, what about an atheist? Are they ethical or not? Uh, and when you say like societal norms, what about Nazi Germany? Was that ethical? What happened there? So according to your definition, it was because that's what was the considered to be okay within that community. Um, so it's a bit more than that. It is. It's part of it. It's part of it, but it's a bit more than that. And the point about not being the same as the law was actually a really good point because things can be legal and unethical at the same time. Can anyone think of an example of something that's perfectly legal? You're not going to get sent to jail for it, but would be considered unethical. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. That yeah. Legal, so, like tax avoidance is like a corporate level, uh, th you know, and the same thing about Ireland and their tax system and the fact that a lot of big tech companies siphon all of their earnings through Ireland cause, so that they don't have to pay as much taxes. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good example. Any other examples of legal but unethical? Smoking while pregnant. Yeah, smoking while pregnant. It's a good one. Anything else? I mean, there's a, I mean, lying to people. There's not. There's no laws against lying to people. Like, uh, like cheating on your partner. It's not illegal. Obviously, unethical. But, is. but what? Perjury. Is. Perjury. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Um, okay. So what about illegal but ethical? Piracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any uh, any other? So we're talking about people with eye patches in boats with pigeons and peg legs. Um, yeah. So what other things could some people hypothetically consider to be legal, but would technically be considered illegal? So, yeah. So some people like to do certain things with their uh, with their body that maybe legally isn't allowed to do, but they would consider it to be their own choice. Maybe, again, hypothetically, some people may consider that to be the case. Um, yeah. Yes. Euthanasia is a hot, you know is is quite a quite a um, an interesting debate debate to have. Um, so yeah. Um, Obviously, it's easier to talk about things in the past that aren't illegal anymore because it's less likely to get me in trouble talking to you guys about things. But so, like, drinking alcohol during prohibition in, in the United States, right? Uh, I think we could all say that that's not really that unethical to, you know, everyone was doing it anyway, but it was against the law. 
Um, so yeah, so the law and ethics aren't the same thing, but if you live in a society that's well functioning, you'd hope they were close, close-ish, right? Because you'd want the, I mean, the whole point of law is to try and enforce your, you know, the fact that you have, have a functioning society uh, if it's designed well. But there'll always be that kind of like, you know, doesn't quite what the law is and what the societal norms are or what different people's opinion of ethics are. Not going to be exactly the same. Um, so yes, so keep that in mind for these, um, the you know, the rest of this discussion because um, the law is one thing and the, the ethical way that you come to your own decision is a separate matter. Um, so the, the focus of this session is on the ethical side of things rather than the legal side of things. Would you say it's unethical to not follow? Would you? Um, so what, what, what about the, you know, you guys, what do you think? Is it unethical to not follow the law? Sorry? Yeah, relative, maybe. Depending on the law. Um, yeah, all right. And in a minute, you'll be able to talk about those things in terms of different ways of thinking about ethics. So what ethics is, is the study of moral beliefs and actions. So it's about finding out what people believe is moral, but also methods for you to reason about what's right and wrong. So the next, the, the next two minutes of, what, of me talking is going to be, will help you give yourself a framework for making these decisions for yourself about what's right and wrong. And then you'll be able to answer that question. What, you know, is, does the, is this specific action right or wrong according to my set of ethics? Is this an ethical thing? And then you've got different ways of reasoning about it. Um, some people will talk about ethics as like a code of conduct and that's kind of like a small subset of like the field of ethics. But sometimes when you like sign up to a um, hack, hacking society or um, whatever, you'll have to like sign a code of ethics, which is just basically, yeah, I'm going to abide by these rules essentially. But ethics in general is a lot wider than that. So human rights is one that hopefully no one here is going to argue with, right? So the, there are inher inherently fundamental rights that people have as human beings. We have a right to life. We've got the right to be free from injury. So we, should, we shouldn't be you know, being tortured. We should have freedom from slavery. So we should have uh, the right to make decisions for ourselves. We should have personal liberty. We should have the right to some freedom of thought and expression, and we should have the right to some level of privacy. Um, so th those are like fundamental rights that the UN sign off on, right? So this is like the world agrees that these are rights that people should have. Um, and the, you know, there's well-founded reasons for believing each of those things, and um, you know, that we're going to talk about different ways of deciding what's ethical. So how do you decide if something's ethical? There's a few uh, term, piece, pieces of terminology that you need to know for this module, but also it's a helpful way of like thinking about ethics in general. So hopefully at the end of this, not only will you, you had an argument with each other about something, but when you are faced with something that you're not sure about whether it's right or wrong, you can think about these different ways of, of considering whether it's right and wrong and decide for yourself what, what you, which of these suits you, you know, your own morality, I guess. So virtue ethics is when you believe that there's some kind of set of virtues or rules that should be applied across the board kind of thing. So if you're literally going to say the law is what's ethical and what's against the law is unethical, then that's kind of the closest thing is virtue ethics, where you say you've got a set of virtues that you believe that all good people live by this set of ways of, of being, and that that's um, actually... Um, Socrates and Aristotle kind of sort of like their era of like of the first kind of like not first but that kind of philosophy of ethics is just like you've got a good person will um, will have self knowledge and through that they'll do the right thing and people that know the right you know the right thing to do will do the right thing and all that sort of thing and then there's hedonism which is actually like this whole subset of ethics and there's all different ways of reasoning about it but generally it's like um, the aim in life is, you know, or what is ethical is when you can maximize pleasure while minimizing pain. So if it's going to make people happy and not cause people injury, then it's a good thing. 
if it's going to make people sad and cause people to be injured, then that's a bad thing, right? And then if you're trying to make a decision between what's right and wrong, you're like, well, is someone being hurt? And is someone getting pleasure? And if those things are both, you know, or like in the right direction, then that's the decision that you should make. And if it's the other way around and, you know, um, the, that, that you're having the negative output, then um, that's a bad decision. That's not the decision you should make. And there's all kinds of ways of like, which is more important, the pleasure or the pain side of it. And all that. So there's all different ways of reasoning about it, but that's generally hedonism. It's all about maximizing pleasure, minimizing pain. Utilitarianism is maximizing the overall good to the society. So you could say, um, what, what is the action that has the, the, the best <coughs> aggregate output for everyone else? So if you're trying to make a decision, uh, you know, do you, um, do you kill one person to save a hundred or whatever? If it's like the thing that's better for the society in, in general, then that might be, that's how you'd make that decision. So you look at um, overall, what's the best outcome? Um, consequentialism is the argument that the means justify the ends. So that's like if, um, you know, the same kind of thing. If I could kill one person and say one innocent person that I have some reason of knowing that they're going to, uh, you know, minority report or whatever, they get, they're going to go and kill a bunch of people tomorrow. They haven't done it yet. They're innocent. But according to cons consequentialism, it would be perfectly right to kill that innocent person if it's going to save a whole bunch of other people because that... The, the ends would justify the means. Um, state consequentialism is where you basically do whatever is in the best interest of your nation, of your state. So you, you do the thing that is actually going to cause your state to prosper. Um, and if you're doing, if someone's doing something that's against the state, then that would be considered the wrong thing to do. Deontology is um, the opposite of consequentialism, essentially. So it's duty ethics. So like the thing that's important are the rules and whether or not the individual action that you're taking is against the rule or not. So killing someone is against the rule is bad, right? We probably we all agree killing someone's bad. Um, so we would say, well, killing one, one person to save 100, that's wrong because the actual action of killing someone is wrong. And if you look at that by itself, regardless of what the, the, you know, the, con the outcome is, it's wrong to kill someone and therefore it's, you, know, you don't do it. Um, so that, so those, those are like the main different ways of reasoning about ethics. Two other pieces of terminology is um, the term ethical egoism, which is that you have the right to do what's in your best interest. So for example, if you're on a capsized boat and there are five people drowning in one piece of wood that will support one person that's alive, according to most laws I don't know about this country but I know it's true in Australia you have the right to kill the other people in order to live it's your right to look after yourself the same as if someone comes into your house with a with a gun and you think that you truly believe that they're going to kill you you're you know it's your right in certain countries to kill them first because it's self-defense right um, you would have died otherwise so you've got the right to defend yourself and to do what's in your own best interest. Um, obviously that can be taken to extremes where people do what's in their best in interest disregarding what's in other people's interest. So ethical altruism is the flip side of that which is that you have an obligation to help people in need. So if you're walking down the street, a mother walks, turns her away, a pram rolls into the street, into the middle of the street, your duty is to save that baby or person or who, what, some little kid runs out into the street you, you should try and save that person. Um, if you see someone struggling, you're walking down the street and you see someone in a lot of pain and they need to get to a, a hospital or an ambulance, then according to ethical altruism, then it, you, sh you are bound to help that person in need um, and you should do something about it. And then I guess the, the, the blurry part is if, say for example, the kid's on a street and there's a car coming and you think you'd be risking your own life to jump out to save the kid and then it's like you're making that judgment between what's more important, saving the other person, you know, to, to live up to ethical altruism or saving yourself by not getting hit by a car so ethical egoism wins out in that argument. Um, and so, that, so that's, so that, that's uh, all of the pieces of, of um, all the terminology that I want you to know about ethics. Um, 
And now if you keep that in mind while we discuss these things, then um, you know, if you don't remember what deontology is or, or um, you know, consequentialism or whatever, you can just say like the ends justify the means or whatever. If you, if, while you're making your point about what you believe in these situations, if you can kind of bring it back to the thing, those things that I was just saying would be the most helpful for this discussion. Uh, if you can, you know, depending on how much of that you remember. So um, consider these scenarios in terms of ethics and law, but mostly the ethics side of things. So if it's against the law, you can mention that you think that's against the law, but whether or not you think it's the right thing to do. And try and make sure that both sides of the arguments are presented. So feel free to play devil's advocate. Okay, so you run a company, your, um, your computers are being hacked. You can see their IP address. Um, what do you do next? Do you think it's okay to look up that IP address to discover their location and ISP of the person that's attacking a system? No. Sorry? No? <laughs> Most of you agree, yes. So yeah, okay. So yeah, port scan the system. So start actually scanning the system to find out more about it. Okay or not okay? Depends on your intentions. Okay. If you're going to do that and you going to disrupt their services, then that's an issue. If you're going to do it and not going to cause any issue or anything, it's not something coming that's going to come after you or anything like that. And mm -hmm. if you've got a reason to sort of do it, oh, why, why did you look at me? Let's look at him instead. Then yeah. So you're saying if, if it's not, if there's no, no actual active reason to do it, then why would you do it? Um, so you, is that what you're saying? If you're so. at a means to an end, if you don't know what your intentions are, you don't know what yeah. the end is, that you're then just trying right. to decision. Okay, say you did do the port scan and you find that there's a vulnerability on their system so that you can actually get control of the system that's attacking you. Um, would it be okay, what would you do? What, w would it be okay to actually compromise their system? Sorry? It says that the attack is ongoing, so it's like it's a bunch of mistakes, you have to Yeah. So the attack's ongoing, so you're saying, yes, hack them back, get access to their machine, and then what? Shut them down. <laughs> Change the password and shut them down. Change the password and shut them down. Um, okay. Um, yes, so, so, um, so I guess the question is, well, the accident that you may have just made is that it could have been a proxy, so like they might, that it might be coming from that IP address, but they might actually be controlling someone else's computer. In which case, you've just turned off potentially a shared resource that could be doing anything. Um, but yeah, so but you know, it, but that's like a possibility. Say, for example, you knew for sure that you were on the attacker's system, then um, then possibly you you know you could argue that. Um, you know that it was correct legally you would be breaking the law but yeah um, so if you manage to identify an attacker what would be like an ethical course of action to take contact the police um, well the, the law it's against the law to to make un, um, unauthorized modifications to a computer. So if you hack their system, then that's you're breaking the law. But they break the law first, and you know maybe uh, there would be something for a court to decide. Is what there a legal way to identify who they are, where they are, and stop that, or do they just have to strengthen their own system and then never worry about who? They, they could. I mean, you could find out who they are just by based on evidence they left on your own computer, and um, you know you could you could certainly figure it out without having to hack into their computer. Because if you um, know their IP address, you contact the ISP, say they weren't using a proxy, you'd be able to see which ISP they were using, you could get a court order, you could request that the ISP give you the details of who was using the system at the time, and yeah, you could find out who it was. Um, but then after that, like, do, you know, do you publicly shame the person? Um, do you take them to court, do it like the legal way? So yeah. Things to think about publicly, um, Okay, so you're, you're hired to do a security test of a company's web app and web server. You suspect the web web um, the database server, which is hosted by a different company, is vulnerable. Is it okay to, to do a pen test on that system as well? No, it's not within your scope. 
Very good. It's not within the scope. So yeah, so you, you should have a clearly defined scope. Um, uh, yeah, so I, you know that's that's fairly straightforward. Um, ethically, when's it okay to try and break into a system? When is it okay? Sorry, when you've got permission. Yeah. Um, any other time? Mm -hmm. What if you own a pacemaker and you have like a um, device that controls your pacemaker and you're not sure how secure it is and you don't have permission to actually test the security of it? Would it be okay to, for you to test the security? Is that your device? Your own device. You'd be allowed to test your own devices. Yeah, but it'd probably be against some kind of healer, wouldn't it? You may have signed some terms and conditions that say that you're not going to try and reverse engineer it or something. Um, but you know, your life your life is on the line because that piece of software, someone else could attack it. You know. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's let's um, let's skip ahead and find something interesting. Okay. So the Kana botnet was created by an anonymous author, spread via insecure devices. So it's actually, it's a botnet that was written, spread through the internet and actually managed to scan the entire IPv4 internet um, and looking for certain types of, certain, certain information. And all the results were published online, a massive big database of information that you can download. Uh, the, the argument was that he saw the opportunity to take a census of the internet. And once everyone moves to IPv6, that's not gonna be possible anymore. So we wanted to take that opportunity and actually find out about the internet. Was it an ethical action? Yes, again, it depends what his intentions were, was it? Well, say his intentions were that he just wanted to honestly collect information about devices on the internet. The software like compromises and hacks into computers and spreads over the internet. That then provides resources to malicious people to be able to, you know, without any sort of right so yeah so it's publishing information about insecure systems and therefore maybe it shouldn't be allowed there are other like Shodan for example is a website that gives you a way of looking through vast amounts of information about uh, device on the internet and you can like find webcams for example there are like thousands of webcams that people have set up and aren't secure and you can connect to them and just look at people's in people's backyards and in their living room and stuff they're really weird um, but th that, that information is uh, also by that reasoning that would be unethical that they publish that information as well but is there not an implied permission given if you don't bother to change the default password so, so you're saying if, if you don't if if you haven't set up security, then you are giving people permission to access something. Is that? Okay, open Wi-Fi networks. Is it okay to connect to their network and start using their internet quota? Yes. But that's that's but so so the reason that the you're taking the exact opposite stance as what you just took. Yeah. Right. Well, actually, the way that this attack worked is it was mostly based on default passwords. <coughs> so the the vulnerabilities that it used to spread um, was mostly like services that had default well, passwords. So like. Maybe they by not securing it, they're giving everyone permission to access it. But then, but then you're saying that like if you can use someone's Wi-Fi network because you're right. But if they've got like a data cap and you're using their data, yeah, exactly. But then again, then you should then be responsible for your own data cap. So again, what's the difference between and something There is a password you use. There is your Yeah. Right. I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, then again, that would apply to every phone box that has open Wi-Fi. It applies to this place. We don't live here, but we can still get on the open visit to Wi-Fi. So the basis for that argument is... Because you've been told that you are allowed to use it. Okay, so the research has already been done, right? All the data is available online. Would it be okay for me to download all that data and do some research on it? Free information. Yeah, it's there for everyone to use. So based on like, it then depends. What do you do with that information? So based, yeah. So if I do like actual research that might help make the world more secure, for example, then yeah. Yeah. So you know, like during um, World War Two, when the Nazis did all kinds of like nasty scientific experiments on people to find out stuff, should we be using the the output of that research and building on it for well, saving people's lives? We have to. We have to. You know. Yeah. The question is: Is it ethical? Um. <laughs> That's an end just to the means of. Like V2 rocket um, research was used to balance the space race, whereas research into killing people, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, so I guess like the, the the official stance of most universities is it is fine to use to use that output and exactly what you said the information's there it would be foolish to ignore it but the research that we conduct we wouldn't do those things yeah. Yeah. So. As what the final intention is that we basically just leave the world all the way. Yeah. So it would be okay then to go on the internet and watch videos over and over again of the twin towers falling down to gain knowledge over the structural rigidity of buildings. Given that argument, yes. So what? What? So you're allowed. You're allowed to use the. You're allowed to use the. Mm -hmm. to research the structural rigidity of skyscrapers and how to make them less likely to fall over. Well, yes, yeah. given the arguments that we yeah, just had so of consequentialism, so essentially with the ends justifying the means and the fact it's already happened and there's no additional action, would you care to make a counter-argument? Because you could, that's the whole point of it. There are multiple points of view and d well, you can argue. Going back to the argument of Yeah. I don't think it is. I don't think it is right to. Uh, yeah. I mean, for example, you know, there's a debate going on in Wales about all the donation, whether it should be an, an opt-out process rather than yeah. an opt-in. Is it okay to take someone, harvest someone's organs against their will, and do it? You can't I don't against think against, yeah. against, against yeah. the wishes of their their family or even in their well, they don't want to donate their organs, but you remove their organs anyway. Do yeah, research. Those would opt out. Well, if they opted out, then. But let's say somebody opts out, opts out. But let's let's say somebody opts out, but they still harvest your organs anyway and do experiments. Is that can you use that evidence? I think is the experiments is on living uh, people without their permission is that goes against human rights. <coughs> so obviously that's against that's against human rights and that's unethical in that sense. But if if someone is no longer alive, do they still have ownership of their body? Do they still have ownership of their decisions? Because they uh, yeah, so, okay, we're getting into the grounds of um, something else. Um, so, we'll s I'll stop you there, I'll stop you there. Um, I think, I think that, um, the, uh, yeah, I think there are, there are arguments on either side of that, and I think that in terms of, like, the cultural census of opinion is that people should have some right whether or not we believe there's any point to it or, or, you know once someone's dead their, their rights should be still upheld just based on what is currently the social norm um and whether it's opt in and opt out i think that that is kind of like I, i'll just i'll make in terms of what's the better for the society as a whole 
is that you can save a lot of lives if you've got more organs to give to people because if there's a shortage it means people are dying it can cause people to die so then you could argue that you know that the best thing for the society is to actually have a system where we you know but would i don't think an opt-out system is actually aiming to not give you an option it's just that in case because people that are lazy would tend to ex it's think it's that it's aiming for people Yeah. So, so I guess if you have to like have a default position, you choose the default position that's better for the society, and then still give you as as a person an option to to have your own. It's not taking away your ability to choose. It's just for the lazy people, making the default setting something that's more beneficial. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, it's not my intention to like take sides. So, um, but there are argu there are arguments on either side of uh, either side of all of these things. Okay, so uh, let's you skip. I haven't even thought about that as well. Like, if you hadn't opted in or out, if you weren't thinking about it, then I don't think it'd be something you felt strongly about disagreeing with. Um, yeah, it's if you really didn't want your organs to go to that, then you would not. You would opt out. Yeah, it should be. It, it's like an education thing, I guess. If they, if it was like swept under the rug and no one knew about it, then that would be horrible. But if they actually make an effort to tell people that that's what the system is, then. Um, you know, and you'd, you'd, assume, you'd assume that you'd have family members that can also make decisions on the person's behalf, and that you know you'd have it it set up in a way that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. That's a whole other thing. Okay. So. All right. So if I could write a, a worm that actually fixed the computers that are infected. Would like I I could write a worm now that was basically based on say Metasploit that could use its whole arsenal of exploits. But once it got into the system, it maybe it patched the system and updated the software and tried to fix the problem. And by you know before moving on to spreading onto all the other computers on the internet. So essentially, you know, imagine that last botnet we we're talking about, except that it was changing the default passwords as it went, um, kind of thing. So if you could write a piece of software that would fix the internet of a certain vulnerability, for example, would it be ethical to release that? <coughs> Why? Because what if systems, like, just because the vulnerable doesn't mean they're bad. Right. Not every, like, everybody in this room might think that vulnerable is bad, but if you have a server that you are in a sandbox or a test box and, and you yep. just need that, that vulnerability, so you have systems that won't work out these, all the softwares with these vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it could have unintentional consequences. Yeah. Right. It's illegal, but whether it's ethical is the question. Yeah. So you're saying no, because modifying someone else's computer without permission is not okay. <coughs> Anyone want to take a, a counter point? <laughs> and that's, and that's okay. That's where you draw the line. The computers are okay, humans go for it. But actually, you're making the counter example because you're saying that computers have more rights than people in terms of virus control. <laughs> All right. I think that would be a minority who wouldn't want their virus to fix. That would be a minority. There would be people that wouldn't want their DNA altered without their permission. Probably, I can imagine there'd be at least one or two. Okay, whistleblowers. If you work for a company and they are doing something unethical but legal, um, what should you do? Yeah. Report them to the regulatory body. Okay. What if there isn't one? There's always a hierarchy. There must be a hierarchy. Some official body. 
Right. But what if the CEO of the company knows about it and they're just like, you know, just. Surely if it gets to like a safe house or a different country and then publish all the information. Yeah. So, okay, but like before we move on to the specific example. Um, Yeah. And you, part of your work, you have to sign non-disclosure agreements. At the end of the day, as a professional in that industry, you have signed a non-disclosure agreement, which means you're not going to disclose the work and the stuff that you're doing. So yeah. if you then do disclose that stuff, I do see the flip side, ethical side of it, but you are breaking your professional, your professional standards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chris? What if you have a, um, you work for a company and they are now working on <laughs> Just get a new job and not ref Okay, Sol? questions for you so uh, this is the last thing I think Snowden hero or nasty criminal guys guys just one at a time we're almost finished so he was letting people know what he felt everyone should, should know what the, the security services were doing. Is it right? As, as a professional, yeah, maybe he shouldn't have said anything. But what he has done, I would say he's a hero. Um, yeah, what, what's, you know, what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's slightly wrong. I would agree with you there as well, Wayne. Pardon? Um, I would agree with you there as well, because coming back to the human rights, we all have a basic right to privacy and stuff that he was <coughs> He was speaking out about was invading people's basic right to privacy, and actually does that override his his professionalism in that way? He saw a basic human right being broken and spoke out about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. That was fun. That was fun. That was good. <laughs>